Hey TLC, uh, my name is Ben, and today we're diving deep on our third core value, which is engage everyone. I'm just going to this over. We're taking a few weeks this summer to go over the church's values in depth. We're taking a week on each value. So as a reminder, these are the values. Seek God desperately, love where we live, engage everyone, which is the topic this week, bless and be generous, and invest in families. It's been really great for us to get to see God's heart for us and the church through these values. So I want to pray before we dive in on this third value. God, thank you for this day, the sunshine, for your word, for how we see Jesus, you act when engaging others. I pray that we would hear that and be doers of that word today. Um, And may these words be your words. Amen. Okay, so I want you to picture one of your best friends, a good friend, or a family member. And is it possible that they have one or two little quirks that you overlook about them, or maybe even love, right? Maybe it's a food allergy, or maybe their insatiable appetite for houseplants. For me, when I met Alyssa, she always had one loud hiccup after every meal. That was, it was an endearing quality. It actually stopped, which is kind of sad. Um, <clears throat> but in college, I had a friend who almost exclusively listened to Coldplay. We loved to tease him about it. I said, what band is this? It was Coldplay. Is this Coldplay? Have you heard this band? Um, I couldn't think of any for me, so you can ask Alyssa later. I just, I, I don't know if I have any. But these are smaller and most likely insignificant things Uh, for us, quirks that we can overlook, right? That's easy, unless you just hate Coldplay with passion. Um, I think we all have these idiosyncrasies about us that we bring to the table. But what about those things that are less lovable or socially unacceptable? How are we, as individuals and as a church as a whole, supposed to Uh, meet and be with people who we're not inclined to jive with on first blush, or who are an inconvenience, or just plain different from us. Just a second ago, we heard from Liz about how Jesus healed this bleeding woman. To anyone else, that would have been an inconvenience, right? It would have been unwelcome due to her being ceremonially unclean from the bleeding. But what did Jesus do? He stopped in the middle of an important mission. He was on his way to save uh, someone's daughter, to save her life. But he engaged with the woman. Even afterwards, she touches his robe and is healed. He could have just kept walking on. But he stopped in the middle of what he was doing. He took time. He called her daughter. He connected with her. As we'll talk about more the rest of the sermon today, Jesus is the perfect example for how we should act. And how did he act in that verse, in those verses? Well, he engaged everyone, from Jairus, the leader of the synagogue, down to a desperate and unclean woman. And that leads to the big idea that we have today. We want to be set apart by how we engage everyone. We see and welcome you to our family no matter your status, age, or history. So whenever you're presented with a new idea or a recommendation, a really good question to ask if you can do it in a non-sarcastic manner is, why does this matter? Why is this important to me? And I think that that can help us learn a lot. So the first thing we want to say is, why as a church does it matter if we engage everyone? Why can't we just act like every other place of business or community? For example, in my job, we all have ranks. We know everyone else's rank. We know how successful everyone else is. And the higher up you rank, the more respect and clout that you have. In sports, we love to decide which athlete is the best. We love to compare and rank. And oftentimes, teams cater to the desire of their star player, sometimes to the detriment of the entire team. Both in our jobs and on our block or our apartment floor, politicking and social standing are ever-present. And I think we can agree it's honestly exhausting. So why does it matter 
that we engage? Everyone? The answer is, because we've been set apart by God to follow Jesus, we try to follow his example, and we know that his gospel equalizes everyone. And let's read this from Colossians 3, 9 through 11. You have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self. You are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your creator. In Christ, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free. But Christ is all and in all. God calls us to live differently. We are set apart or holy. Verse 9 shows us that in Christ we shed the old ways and make way for new ones. And the Bible even goes further and uses stronger language and says that we died with Christ and are to put on a new self in him. So it makes sense then as Christians who are in the world, but we're not of the world, that we should live differently, that we should be different than the local school board. And specifically, how are we different? One big way is that we treat everyone the same. Christ died to save us from our sins, and that invitation is open to everyone. Look at the contrasting groups that we see here in Colossians. We see Greeks versus Jews. Differences in culture and nationality. Slaves versus free people. Differences in job and social standing. And Scythians, who are a violent and uneducated group of people. All of these people are equal in Christ because of the gospel. What these verses are saying is that your heritage, your gender, your ethnicity, your wealth, your past, your education, those don't matter in Christ's family. So in today's language, if you're an illegal immigrant, a refugee, or descended from John Smith, you're welcome here. If you have a PhD or a GED or neither, you're welcome here. If you have a disability or are a Division I athlete, you're welcome here. If you're unemployed or have plenty of disposable income, you're welcome here. The gospel changes everything, and that's why engage everyone is one of our core values. And we've been defining core values as what follows. The principles we have as a church that create a boundary for the church's mission. They keep us aligned to help you follow Jesus, build relationships, and discover your purpose. Okay, so we've got these nice three pieces here at the end. So how does engaging everyone fit into our definition of values? Well, first, following Jesus means doing what he did. And just like we heard earlier, he deeply engaged everyone, from the highest synagogue leader to the lowest unclean woman. <clears throat> Second, building relationships. That's at the core of engaging other people, is building relationships. And finally, discovering your purpose. For this one, let me take a page from Jake's book and remind us what the Westminster Shorter Catechism says about the chief end of man, and that is the purpose of man, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Well, how do we glorify God? One way is to obey him. What did we see in Colossians? We need to have equality. So by having equality, we're obeying God, glorifying him, and discovering our purpose. So engaging everyone fits really nicely in our definition of values. Okay, so hopefully we realize, yeah, okay, engaging everyone sounds good. It's, it's reasonable that it's a value here. But I'll be the first to tell you, it's actually kind of hard to do. It's hard to forego talking to my friend two rows away, who I haven't seen in a couple weeks, to go talk to someone sitting by themselves in the back who doesn't look like someone who I would hit it off with right away. Maybe today you know someone votes differently than you do, and it's hard to talk to them 
much less establish a meaningful relationship. As humans, we often tend to shy away from things that are hard or uncomfortable. So what would happen if we just said, you know what, this is just too hard. I'm just not even going to bother. What, do you, what would happen? Well, a lot of things would probably happen, but my guess is that first, people would not come back to church. If you don't feel known or loved, why would you want to be here? If that happened and we refused to make deep connections, slowly our church would just become a homogenous group of people who look, think, and act the same. We'd be a social club, not a group of sinners proclaiming that we have a need for a savior. Do you know what that sounds like? That kind of sounds like the world, right? And we talked about that before. We'd be ignoring Christ's call on our life. And that's actually a sin. James 4.17 says, it is sin to know the good and yet not do it. So the good here is treating others in Christ equally. So let's flip it around. That's the worst case scenario. But what about the best case scenario? What if we said, okay, let's dream big. Let's actually engage everyone. What would happen? Contrary to people leaving, I think the church would thrive. We'd be known as welcoming to those who don't feel welcome anywhere else. Have you ever heard of someone who doesn't feel welcome at a church because of your social standing or your past? Or maybe that's been you? What if as a church we were known to welcome everyone just because of your faith in Christ? Next, if we engage deeper, I think more people would come to know Jesus, right? If we were known to establish these meaningful connections with everyone, people would have a chance to hear the good news and turn to Christ. And that would bring honor and praise to God in our city. And finally, we know the Bible tells us it's more blessed to give than to receive. When we give of our time and effort to be with and engage people who are different than us, that blesses them, and God tells us that's actually a blessing for us. So this seems like an important value worth pursuing, and that even ties back into what we heard from Andy last week, love where we live. Can we engage those eight neighbors around us like on that magnet that Andy gave us? That's a great example. Now, I want to take a quick minute and say that if you're not a follower of Jesus, first off, we're excited and we love that you're here. Even if you don't share our faith, we want to connect with you. We'd love to share our faith with you, but even still, we'd love to just be with you, meet with you, hang out with you, invite you into our community. And I love that the cards are called Connect Cards. So if you'd like to hang, meet with a pastor or someone on staff or learn more about Jesus, would you write your name and number on that card and drop it in the back like Glenn told us? It's kind of scary and hard, but would you do that? We'd love to bring you into the community. All right. As I said, we've, we've laid out the theory of why engaging everyone is good. It's important. Okay, that sounds great. Seems like we could do a lot of good if we actually did this. But the hardest step is often taking theory to application. So how can we practically engage other people? And I have a few ideas. The best example that we have of someone engaging other people is Jesus. So let's look to him first. And there are a few lines from the book the Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, which we drew on in our New Year's service that I think fit really well here that I'd love to read verbatim. Here they are. Jesus had apprentices. In Hebrew, the word is Talmudim. It's usually translated as disciples. An even better word to capture the idea behind Talmudim is apprentices. To be one of Jesus' Talmudim is to apprentice under Jesus. Put simply, it's to organize your life around three basic goals. Be with Jesus, become like Jesus, do what he would do if he were you. So I really like this idea of apprenticing under Jesus. 
As we saw in our definition of values, one of the things that these values are supposed to do is to push us to follow Jesus. Following Jesus means to be his apprentice or disciple. And these last two pieces here are the what we can focus on for the value today. So let's talk about first becoming like Jesus. To become like someone, we need to know what they were like. So let's think back to those verses that we heard from Liz. Jesus made time for an inconvenient, desperate, unclean woman. In our current era of busyness, this one's pretty tough, right? It would be difficult to stop in the middle of an errand to take time and ruin our efficient scheduling, much less for someone inconvenient or the person asking for money at the stoplight on our way to the grocery store. To further understand what Jesus was like, let's look in Mark 2, 15 through 17. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, They asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So what was Jesus like? He spent time with the outcasts of society. If you're not familiar, tax collectors were Jews who collected taxes of their countrymen on behalf of the occupying Roman Empire. So right away, they're considered as traitors to their countrymen. Second, they often took more than they were supposed to, and that was kind of allowed by the the Romans. So they were greedy. So they were really despised by their fellow Jews. Could you imagine being associated with such traitorous, greedy people? Could you imagine what people thought of Jesus being associated with such traitorous and greedy people? We saw how much disdain the Pharisees had when they saw Jesus eating with them. Have you ever felt betrayed by someone? Or has someone in your family ever felt betrayed? Maybe you had a really good idea at work and someone stole it and claimed it as their own. Or maybe you hired someone and invested time and resources into training them up only to see them leave right away for a competitor for more money. Or have you ever mentored someone, given sacrifice time and poured into them only to see them turn away from your mentorship? Christ would ask you to engage such people. That's pretty hard. That's pretty tough. Further, we saw in the passage, Christ ate with sinners. We're not told here what the sin was, but it's apparent that the sin is obvious to everyone, right? They're known as sinners, so they're obviously sinning. What would engaging with an obvious sinner look like? Maybe spending time with prisoners or those recently released from prison? Maybe it's having dinner with a coworker or a neighbor who's clearly living an anti-Christian lifestyle. Jesus did that. The second point from the book that I want to talk about is to, in the way that we can follow Jesus' example is do what he would do if he were you. This reminds me of the what would Jesus do bracelet, right? What would Jesus do? I don't, there's not tax collectors coming through Arvada today and people sin in reality, is not as obvious as it was in Jesus' day. So it's helpful for us to just ask, what would Jesus do in my situation? For me, there's a neighbor on our block who's honestly kind of annoying to the others on the block. What would Jesus do? He'd probably always stop to say hello, help with yard work, and not gossip behind their back with the other neighbors. Is there a homeless person that comes into your workplace every day or sits by you at Starbucks? 
what would Jesus do? He probably wouldn't switch seats. He'd probably buy their coffee and ask them their name. This morning, maybe you find someone has different views on gender or sexuality than you or supports a different candidate than you. What would Jesus do? He probably wouldn't walk by with eyes cast away or pretend to text on his phone. Now, I do think there's a minute to, I, that I want to take a minute to make an important point. Just because you engage everyone doesn't mean you condone everything that everyone does. Let me say it again. Just because I'm engaging everyone doesn't mean I'm condoning everything that everyone does. And this is extremely true of Jesus. What did he tell these people that he, that he was with, these sinners? He often told them, repent and sin no more. And that's the same with us. Just, we, we should spend time with the gossiping neighbor or coworker, but we don't have to pretend that the gossip is okay. So let's get back. Engaging other people is hard, but it's worth it. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you guidance to engage with those no one else wants to in your own unique situations, because we're all in different situations, because that's what Jesus did. And we want to be apprentices of Jesus. So the first way that we practically engage everyone is look at Jesus' example. The next way that we can practically engage everyone is by not showing favoritism. Let's read James 2, 1 through 4. My brothers and sisters, do not show favoritism as you hold on to the faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. For if someone comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and a poor person dressed in filthy clothes also comes in, if you look with favor on the one wearing the fine clothes and say, sit here in a good place, and yet you say to the poor person, stand over there or sit here on the floor by my footstool, haven't you made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? <clears throat> Here at TLC, which is what we call our church, we cannot show partiality. Later in this passage, James warns that doing so is a sin. In, our, uh, in the verses Liz read for us, Jesus healed, healing the, the bleeding woman. Traditional wisdom would say that Jesus should focus on the important synagogue leader and ignore this desperate woman. But he doesn't. He makes the synagogue leader wait and stop while he talks with her and, is, and he, while he's with her. He makes time for the lowly. Interestingly, if you keep reading in this passage, James even notes later that our human favoritism is actually often deeply flawed. How often are the people we try to make like us, that oh, we want to impress you, are the people who we actually don't really like, we actually disregard? For a toy example, let's suppose John Elway walked in today to TLC, right? <clears throat> I think we all might be like, oh, I've got to get a selfie. Let me get a picture over here. He took a cup of coffee from me. I got a post about this. But yet, how many of us were in our houses reading or looking at the news and saying, like, I can't believe he messed up the draft again, right, for the Broncos? Yet, we'd be so excited to see him, right? But similarly, what if someone, a cashier from King Supers, fresh off the early morning shift, came in and saw us all just fawning over Elway? Would they feel welcomed in our church? Or would they see partiality? And then can I flip it around? You know, often we think about people, the high disregarding the low. But what if someone today, you saw they drove in in a car that you would never be able to afford? Or they are in incredible shape. Or they just seem cool. You know those people that just seem cool. Are you willing to ask that person their name? Say, hey, how long have you been coming here? Partiality can go both ways, right? It's also showing partiality not to engage with someone who we perceive as popular or successful. Maybe more practically, are there people here 
who you see at church, but you'd rather not talk to? Are there people you see, but don't know their name? Maybe you don't bother to know their name? Could we be a church that at least tries to know each other by name? I know it's actually kind of hard to remember names, so let's give grace if you forget a name. I know I asked you your name two weeks ago. Can you please tell me again? Because God would rather us be a church that is connected and forget a few names in the process, right? That's why we have that time of greeting in our service. I know it's kind of uncomfortable for me. Maybe it is for you. But the point is we're embodying a rhythm that pushes us towards this value. And that's why it's important. And I didn't tell him I was going to say it, but you know who's great at this is John Supich over here. When I thought of someone who engages everyone, I thought of John. He's a faithful greeter and a brother in our family. It seems like he's known you your entire life. He tries to establish meaningful connections with everyone he can. And I think you can agree, no one would ever say that John shows favoritism. I'm glad he's part of our family. And speaking of family, the last way that we can practically engage everyone is to act like a family. Now, I know that we don't all have amazing family histories, but let's think about what a good family could look like. I think of the father in the parable of the prodigal son who runs to his son, even though he just spoiled his entire inheritance on wild living. He welcomes him back and has a party. I think of people who always have your back, even though they knew what you were like as a teenager and as a toddler. Ephesians 2, 18 through 19 says this, For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household family. In Christ, we are family. That's why throughout history and now, Christians call one another brother and sister. We've been adopted because of the gospel. So let's act like a family, caring, loving, forgiving, serving, helping those in the body of Christ. Even if we live in different neighborhoods or if we have different parenting styles. I'm in a small group with a few guys from church, and we meet about once a week, and we talk about the highs, the lows. We go through the Bible or other books. We talk about real stuff. We've seen God answer prayers. Those guys are my brothers. I know I could text them at any time, and they'd pray for me. And you know what the coolest thing is? We were formed somewhat randomly. We weren't best friends beforehand. We don't have the same past. We don't work the same jobs. We're not the same age. We're just in the church. And so we're family. And I want to say, if you're not in a small group like that, we've got a bunch of those things going on, and we're actively trying to grow it. So if you've even thought about it, or you feel like God's saying, hey, you should do that. One, can you, write, you could write it on your Connect card, or tap Glenn, or Andy, or me, or Alyssa, or anyone, and just say, hey, I, I'm feeling God say I should be in it we will get you connected because that's a great way to grow in our church family. Okay, so it, we can agree, I think, being in a family is a good thing. But most of us are, well, all of us are just born into a family, right? Some of us maybe are adopted, but it's not our default nature to go looking for people to add to our family. But this is a way that God has us do things differently. He wants us to add and invite people to our family. Think about what he did when he healed the bleeding woman. She reached out, touched the robe, was healed. He stopped, turned, and said, daughter. Her faith brought her into the family of God. And maybe that means, as I said, foregoing chatting with your friends after church, talking to someone new for a few minutes. Can you find someone that you can walk to the mechanism in the back while you get your chairs onto that thing in the back there. Maybe you could have someone over for dinner who you only wave at at church. Maybe you could host an open invite 
pickleball party or a splash pad hangout, or maybe sign up for the Rockies game coming up. Those are things that families do. We might have to think creatively, but over time, we can become a family with Christ as the thread holding us all together. And then we grow, and that makes God happy. Here at the local church, we're more than a place to just attend. We are a family to be a part of. So let's wrap it up with a reminder of what we've learned. We saw that engaging everyone is important because God has set us apart to follow Jesus. In Christ, your background, your wealth, your gender, your education, your status don't make anyone, don't, don't make you worth more or less. The gospel equalizes everyone. We see this in the life of Jesus who spent time with the outcast and the despised of society. He took time out of his schedule to heal a desperate woman. It's hard, but as individuals and as a church, we need to try to live the same way. How do we do it? Talk about three things. First, be like Jesus. Ask yourself, what would he do in my shoes? Second, don't show favoritism. And third, act like a family. I want to challenge us to do that. Ask yourself, what would Jesus do? Don't show favoritism and be a good brother or sister. And as we strive to build meaningful relationships with everyone around us, let's remember these verse, this from Ephesians 2, 3 to 5. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under wrath, as the others were also. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. Before we knew Christ, we were living in sin, and we were dirty. Christ died for us while we were still sinners, not when we were clean, righteous, and sin-free. He engages sinners and brings them into the family. Could we do the same? So if you can, would you stand? If you're able, I want to read the verses that come after that Colossians 3 passage that we read. And I pray, I want to pray this over us as we go into the week, that it would encourage us to engage others more deeply and love those in and out of TLC. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a grievance against another. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. Above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity, and let the peace of Christ, to which you are also called in one body, rule your hearts and be thankful.